Okay. All right. Hello. You're the director of the Dutch Palace Het Loo exactly. in Apeldoorn. And you are about to start an enormous renovation of the palace. What's the idea behind it? Well, the idea behind it is to create more space for visitors, for visitor center and temporary exhibitions. And what we're going to do actually is in uh, underneath the central courtyard, huge, build a huge extension of more than 5,000 square meters. Um, and once it's finished, um, you will only see uh, that we have a slight change in the uh, outline, which means that uh, the four grass parts will be replaced by glass with a thin layer of water running over it. Um, this is, yeah, it's, can, can people walk on the glass? Yeah, they can actually walk on it. Okay. Uh, and the reason is that when, when you're below and you look outside, you look through the glass and you see the palace. But it is also uh, when the sunlight comes in and through the water, you will have an amazing view in the in the central court. Yeah, changing yeah. lights. And it, and yeah, it's going to be fabulous. Yeah. Actually, it's, you can't have it on the um, uh, on the photos, but once you're in there, it's 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 actually amazing. Um, we will have. Uh, that was actually part of your brief, wasn't it, to the architects to say we're going to spend a lot of money on this and years of work, but you don't want anybody to see anything from the outside. Yeah, actually that is true because the, the palace was renovated 30 years ago and what they did is really reconstructed to the 17th century. And this is the image we would like to keep, because, uh, so no, no pyramid like the Louvre, mm -hmm. uh, because it is a palace and not a museum. Well, it, actually it's both of yeah. course, but uh, we said to the architecture, do everything underground, uh, don't touch the palace, um, uh, we're going to restore it, but once you're underneath, go ahead. So there will be a, a, a junior museum and also something, the, the junior palace you're calling it? Yeah. And also the House of Orange, what's that? Well, the House of Orange is the, the permanent collection in which we uh, explain to the visitor the, the history of the House of Orange from the 16th century also to the present times. And we really want to tell stories to the people, how, how the palace worked, but also stories about the history, how the members of the House of Orange um, operated in time. And this is going to be a project of three years. You're closing in January yeah. and planning to reopen when? In 2021. 2021. And actually the palace is closed, but the stables and the garden will be open to the public and we will invite visitors to go to the roof uh, like we did together. And so you have a magnificent view of the garden, but also of the renovation project. Okay. And for now, before you close, in January you're going to have the palace in its uh, Christmas uh, uh, yeah, decoration. Exactly. We have a very strong tradition of laid tables and Christmas decoration. And this year, uh, we're going to put everything on the table. <laughs> <laughs> so we have the most beautiful uh, porcelain from the royal collections on display in the palace. And it's uh, a real spectacular end before we start the renovation project. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'll be back. Okay, please do. Thank uh, you, Michel uh, Van Okay, you're welcome. Hello. You are the author, you're an Irish journalist, and you are the author of this book, Kill All Normies? Good Lord. Online Culture Wars from 4chan and Tumblr to Trump and the alt-right. First question for our viewers, who is the frog on the cover? <laughs> it's a reference to Pepe, who's um, a cartoon frog that uh, became a kind of symbol of... Um, uh, the alt-right or a, an online kind of um, uh, forum culture that that um, developed a new kind of youthful style of, of, of uh, right-wing politics. Um, you just gave a really interesting talk here in the, the Bali in Amsterdam about your book and one of the many eye-openers for me was what you said about the alt-right that they reject 
the premise which to me was, as a child of immigrants, to me was always the premise on which the U.S. was built, that uh, uh, everyone was welcome and if you worked hard enough you would f find the American dream and everyone could, uh, uh, could get the best out of his life. And you say that the alt-right rejects this basic premise of mm. being American. Mm. Yeah, I mean, they're very, um, uh, they're very suspicious of uh, that version of America, the melting pot kind of idea. Um, they say that, you know, America was built by uh, white men and um, that it's essentially just a lie or it's ideology to say that um, America I is about, you know, abstract concepts and, you know, universalism and rights and um, equality and, and so on, and that it's a nation of immigrants. They say America is what it is because it was built by white Anglo-Saxon Protestant men. It has been very impactful on American politics. To what extent was the alt-right influential in getting Donald Trump elected? I don't think it was necessarily... The, the alt-right in the very strict sense was not influential in getting Donald Trump elected. It but but the, the there was a whole um bunch of little you know sub cultures and and forums and and kind of tendencies and things like that which were uh, broadly kind of trumpian and is the republican party glad with the rise of the alt right or are they frustrating the american the republican agenda as trump to him <laughs> himself is too well i mean yeah the republican party are not even happy with trump let alone the the um you know people posting nazi memes on the internet um you you ex you yourself expressed concern today about uh, maybe taking the alt-right too seriously by writing this book about them. Some people would say, it's just the lunatic fringe, you can better ignore them. Mm. But you haven't, you've written a book about them, so you do think that they're important enough to merit your time. Mm. I mean, I can only guess, because for all I know, the whole thing will implode in a couple of months, and you know, I, I'll, I'll be proven wrong, but um, I, so I'm going on something of a hunch, you know, but I do think that when small but very energetic little cultural vanguards sort of appear, people know it. Like there's something that you just instinctively know, you know, whether it's punk or whatever it is. Um, people know that this is something that's going to be influential. Um, what I find alarming is that the alt-right is not just off on its lunatic fringe on the internet saying naughty things and uh, getting off on, uh, on their version of freedom of speech. What I find alarming is the alt-right is going offline and also becoming violent, as we saw in Charlottesville. Mm. Where do you see this going? Um, well, they have kind of... I think they were surprised by the extent of the you know, backlash against them from um, protesters and from the state as well. I mean, the, the, you know, they did send in, you know, militarized police um, and they had them sort of penned in in a, in a little area. So, um, you know, they, they, I think, and they were, a lot of them were doxxed. Their personal details were revealed. They, many of them lost their jobs and, and probably personal relationships and stuff as a result. So, you know, the backlash was major. And I think maybe some of them who are, in an online bubble where they've normalized this stuff to themselves. Maybe weren't expecting that, I don't know. But still online you can have a tremendous political impact. Are you one of the uh, normies in your book? Kill all normies, are you a normie? Um, I'm afraid I'm a normie. Probably not. I've always been very aware of and very interested in radical politics. I know more about them than most people, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I guess I'll, I'm kind of one, but not entirely. <laughs> <laughs> Angela Nagel, thank you for writing this book. Thank you for being here at the Bali and for this talk. Thank you.